Okay, good morning folks. Um, see we are on lecture 26 today. How's the uh, project 2 going? Um, to start early, yes. Hi, I'm Kim from the setting the transition to like exactly 50% of the chord. I'm not doing X coil, but in terms of like setting it exactly like you said in lecture, how is that done in the chord? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. It comes up kind of almost every year, I think. Um, so, So, um, I tried to clarify this in those red boxes that I drew on the assignment. Yeah. Um, this is hard to explain, so I'm not um, surprised if it's not completely clear. So what I mean by this is um, translation. Maybe this is a translation. Set the um, extent of favorable gradient, which can be thought of as the start of the transition ramp. Two point five C. Okay, so this is kind of how we have been doing things, right? So let's take the upper surface, something like this, and lower surface. I'm just drawing it in very um, schematic form. So maybe you'll have a favorable gradient with a lot of segments to this point. Oh, sorry, yeah. Okay, so maybe just in a sketch, um, this may be, say, your airfoil uh, concept, right? So you have a transition ramp, which may have m multiple segments, but this is your extent of favorable gradient. And on the lower surface, maybe you'll have something like this. And this is the, this is the point at which So favorable gradient ends here, right? And then there's a transition ramp because you don't want favorable gradient to suddenly become adverse pressure gradient with a sharp corner. So you have like three segments maybe that smoothly transitions favorable gradient to adverse pressure gradient. Um, so when you're at low drag conditions, like when you're operating within the drag bucket, the velocity distributions may look something like this. So this is this point. And then you have a fa uh, transition ramp that maybe goes till here. And then you have a recovery region. Um, on the lower surface, you might have something like this. And then your transition ramp goes something like this. And then you have this, right? So what I want by asking you to do this part is I w I'd like you to set these to 50% or whatever it is that I asked for, right? And there are many segments. So this can get very quickly um, to become a lot of trial and error if you set it manually. Okay, so the way you set this is you, you change the fee. So you should know what the control is. The control is this fee for this segment. 
If you change the fee, if this is like 48%, it will become 49%, 50% or something. But you can do that like once. You do it three or four times and you get it right. But then the minute you go and change something else, this fee will move. The fee will be the same, but the X will move to some other point. Right, so it will get very quickly frustrating. But that's the point of those Newton lines. So the Newt 1 F0 line, use this to adjust fee. So you have to adjust the correct fee. So you have to adjust, let's say, this is 1, 2, 3, and 4. So this is number 4. That's what you have to adjust. And then let's say 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and this is 13. So you have to adjust fee to get desired x over c for the segment endpoint. So you can use one newt S0. Um, so you can say adjust fee for number four to set x over c for number four. That's this point. Get that working. Once you get that working, then you can go and add another Newton line that says, hey, on top of that, go and adjust fee 13 to set x over c of 13. So when you do both, then it will automatically, it will change fee 4 to get you x over c of 4 to say 50%. It will change, on, in addition, it will change fee 13 to get you x over c of fee 13, and then it will do both. So it'll, if you set up 10 knobs, it will constantly twiddle 10 knobs even though, you know, when you change one knob, it'll go and corrupt something else, but the, it'll change the other, that particular knob. It'll, it'll just manage everything beautifully. Okay, does that make sense? Is anybody having trouble? Has anybody succeeded in getting this working? The Newt 1 is zero. I know, you, Ed, you got it working yesterday, right? Yes. You have this working. You said it, I, I'm just using what you have for the uh, input files. Is there any reason you should change that at all? Um, do you remember what it is? I'm... No. So, okay. So, okay, let's get to that in a minute. But, um, so there are some times when this won't work, right? You, you have to be... I mean, this is supposed to automate things, but at the same time, if you ask for something um, impossible or something that doesn't make sense, then this thing will crash. So, for example, we have 14 here, and then we have 15 here, and then we have, sorry, this is, uh, no, this is 4. I read this as 4. Uh, so this is 3, and this is 5. So now let's say x over c, before you start the Newton iteration, let's say x over c of this is at, um, uh, let's call it 45. And let's say x over c of this is at 52. So obviously you can't move the phi 4 so that it tries to come and cross 5 and go to this side of 5 or go to this side of 3. Right, so when you have a lot of segments kind of tightly spaced, you have to be careful that what you're asking for doesn't violate some other thing. Like four cannot be after five and four cannot be before three. So um, you, you sh maybe it's a good thing to find out where this four is and then set the Newton line to move it just a little bit and then make sure it works. Once you have it working, then you know that Newton line is set, right? So the other thing you can do, and I've done this sometimes, but it, it starts to get, it might take a little bit of time to set all these up nicely. So if you want to set this up at 50, 
maybe you should set this up at 48 and maybe you should set this up at 43 or something like that. So these things all start moving together and it's not like one thing is coming and trying to jump over to the other side. Or the other thing might be to, uh, I mean, you could think of removing some of these segments or something. Whatever it is, just let's say you have this airfoil and it's like this, right? This is 45, this is, this is 43, 45, 50, 52. Now, let's say you want to bring this to 30. I think one of the questions is make the extent of favorable gradient 30% chord, right? If you ask this right now to go to 30, it won't happen. Because 30 is way here, so you're asking this to jump past 5, 6, 7 and then go there, right? You really have to squish everything else down and then make this go to 30. So just because there's a Newton line to automate things, it's not like you can blindly use it and it'll always work. Um, so just keep that in mind. Before we go to Ed's question, any other um, Comments or questions about this? Okay. So your question is um, question number two. Should we change the Newton line for phi I leading edge, right? So there, I think the Newton line goes something like this. Newt 1 G0, um, I've forgotten the code, the, the, the key for it. I think it's like 100 or something. Something like this essentially says adjust phi leading edge. Is this the first Newton line, right? Is that what you're talking about? Um, phi leading edge. I, I kind of meant the, the phi value. Okay. Okay, you're talking about something else. Okay, so I think the first Newton line, anyway, let me go ahead and talk about this since I've started. So this is Newt 1 G0, and I don't remember the syntax, but essentially this is like adjust phi leading edge, or it could be adjust phi for everything phi for all the segments except the very last one. Um, to achieve KS, and this here again, the reason there are two choices is really the, the phi leading edge is what you should adjust. But if you have segments close by, sometimes what you end up doing is you're telling the Newton iteration to adjust this to achieve some KS, and if you're very far away from that KS that you want, the Newton iteration will make this go this way, this way, this way, and then it'll come here, right? It'll, the Newton iteration doesn't know anything about this other segment. So it'll try to make phi leading edge go to cross the other, jump over the other segment, and then the, the conformal mapping mat will fail and the program will crash. So. To avoid that, there is an option saying, hey, don't just change the phi leading edge, move everything. So if you move phi leading edge by half a degree this way, all of these will also move by half a degree that way. And so they'll all slide around and the phi leading edge phi won't cross over the other phi. Um, so that option is there. I don't remember what I put in the example file. Uh, you might find, I, I think 800 is the other option. So uh, phi all is like 800. This, there'll be a code here saying 800. If it's 800, then it's all the fees. Um, that's fine too. Either of them can be used. So um, I guess your question really is, should you change
I don't know. I mean, usually you don't have to mess with that, but occasionally something will happen where it depends on what your, where your design, airfoil design, where it is going, right? So I can't say categorically that you don't have to touch it. But most of the time, this is not what you focus on, unless something, you know, breaks, it doesn't converge or the code doesn't work or something like that. So I'll just say usually no. Um, any other questions? So this is the reason you should st get started. If you haven't started, it takes time to understand these little things. Um, just don't wait too long. And suddenly you'll find that things don't work and if you're doing this at the last minute, it'll just be sort of a panicky situation. It's just like writing code in some ways, except that here it's all kind of new, right? Yes. Uh, sorry, I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, so I think at the beginning we're adjusting the CL to the lower part of the drag bucket and we're using the alpha stars on the lower segment to do that. Um, is that just like an iterative process that we're changing like each alpha star by what we're doing or are we using a Newton line for it? And if we're using a Newton line, why are we adjusting with that knob? So the question is, um, I think I tried to explain this in Piazza also. Did you all see that message? No? Yes. You saw, you got the message, right? Okay. So I'm saying set the lower corner of low, CL for lower corner. V equals something like, I don't know. I don't know what the number is. Okay, maybe 175 miles per hour. Um, basically what this means is, first find the aircraft CL for flight speed of So you use the level flight equations, lift equals weight, and you'll get that. So I think I've given you wing loading, which is weight over area, wing area. So we assume airfoil CL is very close to aircraft CL for wing. This will work. I'm, it's, it's reasonably correct. So you know the airfoil CL. And what, what I want is that, and I think this is very close, similar to what's done in the paper, right? So you have a drag bucket like this. This CL should correspond to this 175 mile per hour. So if you don't position this correctly, you know, you might get a drag bucket like this. This is, this is the wrong CL because if you're flying at this maximum speed, if the aircraft is flying here, you'll be in a very high drag portion, right? So you want to bring this down so that the CL, the drag bucket is, includes the CL. If you bring it too much down, then you're sort of wasting the drag bucket at very high speeds where the aircraft is not going to be able to fly. So that's the idea. Um, so how do you achieve this? Usually uh, a good, you know, we saw this in all the demos and you, I don't know if you absorbed all of that, but let's say you have a lower surface like this. If you take all these lower surface alpha stars and add to it by say one degree, the drag bucket will usually move up by 0.1, you know, because it's 0.11 times alpha star is CL star, right? So you can actually make a pretty good guess as to what how much you have to add to these alpha stars to move the drag bucket up and down. That is iterative, but it's like a manual iterative procedure because the way you get drag bucket is by running X-foil. 
And so profile Newton iteration can't do anything about that, right? So you you have to do that manually, and it it will once you figure out the pattern, this will get done very quickly. And so at some point, let's say after three or four iterations, you get this drag bucket here. Usually you can change a lot of other things, but this lower corner, it'll move up very little bit up and down. It won't move up drastically. And that's already, like, that'll be set. It'll almost like it'll be anchored there. That's the nice thing about inverse design, because you are thinking about it from, from aerodynamic point of view, and you've set, you've filled around and tailored the aerodynamics of the lower surface, and then you, you don't worry about it, you bother about everything else. Okay. Okay. Um, Shall we move on to thin air foil theory? So on Tuesday again, um, before Tuesday, try to make progress with the project so that if you have questions like this, I can try to address them. Okay, so in the last class, we wrapped up thin air foil theory for symmetric air foils. Um, and I'm going to continue using pre-prepared lecture notes to talk about cambered airfoils. Um, we, we are going to go back to this boundary condition equation that we derived last time. Okay. So this is where, this is the boundary condition equation we derived. And this is written in terms of theta the angular coordinate, which goes from zero at leading edge to pi at trailing edge. And so integral zero to pi of this stuff should be equal to this, and this is the zero normal flow expression, right? This time we keep the dz dx. This is the slope of the camber line. This was zero for the symmetric airfoil, but cambered airfoil, obviously, it's not zero. Okay, so big question is how do we solve it? We're going to use the same transformation, x equals c over 2 times 1 minus cosine theta, so dx becomes this. And on top of that, we have to satisfy the kata condition, which says that at the trailing edge, where theta equals pi, the vort vortex sheet strength should be 0, so gamma equals 0. So obviously, um, this is not, I mean, I'm assuming it took many years for Glauert and other people to slowly make progress and finally solve it. Um, we are at a point where all of this has been, you know, understood and put in textbooks and all that, so we're just going to march through it in one class. But, I mean, it's a, it's a huge thing, right? Whenever they went and figured all this out, it must have been a big um, breakthrough. So what they found is the best thing to do is to take the solution for gamma as a function of theta, right? This is what we want to solve, the vortex sheet strength. Take it as a sum of two parts. So write gamma as gamma 1 plus gamma 2. And the first part is going to be the symmetric airfoil solution or something very similar. So this does not involve the camber shape. It only... Um, is affected by change in angle of attack. So this is the symmetric airfoil solution because symmetric airfoil solution gave us how gamma changed when you change angle of attack. So this has the familiar form of 2 times V infinity A0 times 1 plus cosine theta over sine theta. This is actually very pretty much identical to what the symmetric airfoil solution is, except that in the symmetric airfoil solution, Instead of A0 here, you had alpha, right? So this is the, essentially this is the change in vortex sheet strength due to change in angle of attack. That's the first part. The second part will be the part that does not change with angle of attack, but will change due to camber. Okay, so that's what we are coming to next. Anyway, the first part is pretty much done. We did the symmetric airfoil solution, and that's the, um, that's the solution. 
So, second part, oh, this thing is, is it on? Oh, autofocus was on, okay. Okay, second part depends only on the camber line and is finite everywhere, including at the leading edge. So, um, this is where Fourier series comes in, right? So, I think in many engineering problems, Fourier series is used, especially if you have some unknown variation and you don't know what it is, you assume it's a Fourier series and then you solve for all the Fourier coefficients. So, here they assumed that the second gamma, gamma 2 as a function of theta, is a sum of several sine functions. So sine, um, so it's 2 times v infinity, summation n equals 1 to infinity, a n sine n theta, right? So let's look at what these sine theta shapes look like. So we are talking about theta equals 0 to pi. So this is the leading edge, this is the trailing edge. X equals 0 to 1 becomes theta 0 to pi, right? Sine of 1 theta, if, if um, n equals 1, right? Sine n theta, n equals 1 is sine, sine theta is just this. This is a familiar sine theta um, shape from 0 to pi. Sine of 2 theta is something like this. Sine of 3 theta is something like this. So you can keep on going like this to n equals infinity and you take, so the idea behind this solution is you take this shape, multiply it by some scaling factor A1, which we don't know yet. You take this, multiply it by another scaling factor called A2, take this, multiply it by A3 and so on. And that's the whole idea behind Fourier series. The idea is if you do that correctly, you can approximate sort of any distribution you want. And we don't know what the distribution is, so we are going to leave it in terms of unknowns A1, A2, A3. But when you solve the final answer, you solve, go through the whole procedure, then we'll figure out what the A1 and A2 and A3 are. But the idea is when you add all those different sine waves, each one scaled separately, you might get the final solution something like this. So we are attempting to obtain some shape like this by adding the scaled sine n theta distributions. Okay, so that's the idea. So the final, the form of the vortex sheet strength is this. This is gamma 1 and this is gamma 2. And all of these are unknowns. We have all these coefficients, a0 and then a1, a2, a3 that come from here. All of these are unknowns. But one good thing is cutter condition is automatically satisfied, right? Cutter condition wants us to put gamma equals zero at the trailing edge. And so all of these automatically have gamma equals zero at the trailing edge. So cutter condition is satisfied. Okay. Mm. So kata condition is satisfied, but boundary conditions need to be satisfied. So that's how we are going to determine the unknowns. So we need to determine all of these unknowns so that the boundary condition of zero normal flow is satisfied at all the points from leading edge to trailing edge, everywhere along the airfoil. So the way to do it is to substitute it into the boundary condition equation, which we started off with the beginning of the class, right? So this is what we started off with. This is the boundary condition equation. So we'll plug everything in by writing the full expression for gamma, and then we'll see how to satisfy it. So if you do that, if you plug it into the boundary condition equation, at some location x equals x0, which corresponds to theta equals theta 0, this, this is what the boundary condition equation is. So this says that your A0, A1, A2, A3, all of this should be such that at this location X0, the right hand, when you evaluate all this, you should get alpha minus dz dx, which is slope at X0. 
So here you are satisfying the boundary condition at one place. Um, Okay, what happened? I think I lost track of some pages. Okay, yeah, I think, um, yeah, okay, I think I'm fine. I just got confused. Okay, so we have two integrals here. So we have two integrals. The first integral is this, second integral is this. Um, first of all, the question is how to evaluate these integrals. The first part is easy because we solved it in the last class for symmetric airfoils. So the first integral, um, so 0 to pi 1 plus cosine theta over cosine theta minus cosine theta 0. This simply becomes equal to pi. We discussed this in the last class. This is how we solve for symmetric airfoils. So it's only the second integral that's now sort of new, so to speak, for our course. And this can be solved using Glauert's standard integral. Okay, so it turns out this is just one step. If you, if you go back to the last class and refer to Glauert's standard integral, um, you can prove this for yourself. Summation, you don't even need to think about the summation. Just think of this and remove the summation here, right? This integral turns out to be a n cosine n theta 0. And then you put the summation back in both sides. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. You can prove this for yourself. And so now the boundary condition equation becomes I've put the dz dx on the left-hand side, so a little bit of manipulation. dz dx, now this is the slope at some location theta. So this is equal to alpha minus a0 plus the summation, a n times cosine n theta. Um, okay, so for any, the idea behind all this is if you're given a camber line shape, you should be able to analyze it with thin airfoil theory. So for a given camber line shape, you will know the slope. You can get the slope dz dx as a function of x, which means you can theoretically at least convert that function of x to function of theta. So that's the procedure we'll go ahead with. So what we'll do is it we'll integrate both sides of this from zero to pi and we will um, see whether it simplifies. So one of the things we are going to do is cosine of n theta d theta, when you integrate from zero to pi, will always be zero. Okay, this is a standard known integral. So, so the, um, that's why we are integrating it zero to pi, because then this will drop out. So when you do that, you have um, A0 becomes alpha minus 1 over pi integral of 0 to pi dz dx as a function of theta d theta. And um, so, so we know how to get A0. This is how we get A0. but we still have all those other terms, a1, a2, a3, right? So we still have to do that part. So we have figured out this one. At least we've got a procedure to do it. We now have to get all these. And to do that, again, this is, um, you know, back in the time when people were so good at thinking, of, thinking through all this in um, analytically. So we use this 
well known standard integral. So any time you integrate 0 to pi cosine of n theta times cosine of m theta d theta, it can, there can be only two answers. But this is only for integration 0 to pi, right? If m is not equal to n, then this integral is 0. And if m equals n, it is pi, pi over 2, right? So that's the insight that they've used to figure out how to solve for these. So what they say is, the solution goes like this. Multiply both sides of the boundary condition equation by cosine of n theta and integrate from 0 to pi. And when you do that, you will get a n is 2 over pi integral 0 to pi of dz dx as a function of theta times cosine n theta d theta. So that's what, this n and this n are the same. So if you want a1, you multiply this by cosine theta d theta. If you want a2, multiply this by cosine 2 theta and so on. So, um, so what happens is, the nice thing that happens is all of the other terms drop away. So I guess I've um, skipped some steps. So let me try to tell you what happens. So when, so you're going to multiply this by cosine of n theta, right? So I think I can squeeze this in into this box. So you have things like this. You have integral a n cosine of n theta times cosine of m theta, 0 to pi. So only when, uh, so when m is not equal to n, this will be, this will be equal to 0. So, you know, you have a summation of, um, you have a summation of many, many terms, n equals 1 to infinity. So really this is, this is a lot of terms and you're integrating a lot of terms. But the beautiful thing is if you multiply it by cosine of n theta, everything will drop out except one term. And that's the only term that survives. And that's how, that's how a n turns out to be this. Okay, you, you, to see this, you should really actually sit down and work through it. That's, go through the step. It's, I mean, it'll take you half an hour or something, but you'll see how everything drops out and a n becomes only this integral. All of the other integrals will go away. And that's how we can determine all the a values, a0, a1, and so on. So, obviously, um, we don't want to take infinite number of terms, but typically we choose an n max, n max of 25 or something, and that gives good enough answers. After that, you get diminishing improvements, right? So you can do 100. Nowadays, we have computers, so we can throw in any number we want. But back in the day, you know, they would just work with 5, n 1 to 5. They, they get really good answers with that. And so anything higher than that, you neglect as negligible contributions. So in a little while, we'll actually take, a, take an example airfoil and work through it. We'll take a parabolic camber line and, uh, and do the solution. So hopefully that will become clearer. So right now it seems like we're just doing some random integration here and there and getting some answer. But we, we'll work through a, an example case. Okay, so I don't know if you have realized it, but we have actually figured out um, how to get this um, gamma, yeah, so this, so we, what, this is what we were trying to do, right? We wanted to get, we want to get gamma, and we wrote this gamma as a function of many things, like A0, and a bunch of other terms. We've got a process in place for calculating A0 and calculating all the ANs up to some n max. So we've figured out how to get gamma. Now, so we, we know how to get gamma for a known camber line. 
what can we do with the gamma? We want to get something else, right? We want to get lift and pitching moment and those kind of things. So let's see how we can get some airfoil characteristics once you know gamma. So one of the things that's of interest is the pressure difference between the upper surface and lower surface. And how does the pressure distribution vary along the cord? Now that's the sort of thing we, we do in airfoil design, uh, like here. You know, in the very beginning of this class, I was talking about how you might get a velocity distribution. Right, velocity distribution is analogous to pressure distribution. And so if this is pressure distribution, this is a, this difference is how that pressure is distributed along the cord. And that directly tells us how the, what the lift is and what the pitching moment is. So, so that's one of the things that we want to know. And so let's talk about how to get delta P distribution along the cord. Um, so let's say there's PL here and PU here, lower and upper. Delta P is PL minus PU. And since we are doing thin air foil theory, we don't, we don't know anything about the thickness, right? So we are talking about a camber line. And we say over a small segment, if this is PL, this is PU, that's delta P. So delta P is PL minus PU. And from Kutta-Jakowski theorem, it is just rho V infinity times gamma of X. So this part is pretty easy, right? Once we know gamma of X, you just have to multiply rho V infinity and you've got the pressure difference distribution along the cord. Now let's talk about how we get lift coefficient. Obviously, that's one of the first things you want from, air, from an airfoil. You want to, at any given angle of attack, and if you have a certain camber line, what is the CL? So CL is just integral of delta P, and then non-dimensionalized by dividing it appropriately. So delta P is just rho V infinity gamma. So you, you integrate that from zero to chord, and you plug through that. This, this is the expression we have to solve, right? Here, um, Q infinity here is just dynamic pressure. It's a short form for dynamic pressure. Okay, so if you have all the A0, A1, and A2, and all that, you can do the integration from zero to pi, and it's, um, it should give you CL, but you know, as before, we have an infinite number of terms, or maybe, maybe not infinity, but 25 terms of A, right, A1, A2, A3, all the way to 25. But this is the beauty of how they came up with this theoretical solution, is just lots of things are going to disappear. So here again, right, when you do 0 to pi, integral 0 to pi, you have A0, and then a0 co cosine theta, and then A1 sine squared, A2 uh, sine 2 theta, sine theta, A3, so on, right? So we have a product of sine n theta and sine theta. Again, the, the nice thing about integrating 0 to pi is this standard integral. It comes back again. Any time you integrate 0 to pi, sine of n theta times sine of m theta, it'll either be zero or pi over two. It'll be zero when n is not equal to m. So all the terms except this will drop out. So this will become zero, this will become zero. You can go to infinity, all of them will become zero, and only this will survive, and these two also. So this big, long, Equation will simplify to just this. CL is just 2 pi A0 plus pi A1. All the other A terms drop out. Um, then we can get pitching moment about the leading edge. And I'm going to skip the details. The de derivation is very similar to lift coefficient. And so CM leading edge is minus half pi times A0 plus A1 minus A2 over 2. So what does this tell us? So it tells us that lift coefficient depends only on the two terms, A0 and A1. 
Pitching moment about the leading edge depends on three terms, A0, A1 and A2. Um, from these two you can get pitching moment about the quarter chord. Okay, so pitching moment about the quarter chord is CMLE plus CL divided by 4. So if you plug that in, you get CMC over 4 is pi over 4 times A2 minus A1. That means this depends only on A1 and A2, and it's actually independent of CL. So um, what is the special thing about a pitching moment that's independent of lift coefficient? You've probably seen it. I just covered it so we can have a discussion. What does it mean if a pitching moment doesn't change with angle of attack or lift coefficient? What is it called? Yeah, that point is called aerodynamic center, right? The only point, the point about which pitching moment does not change with angle of attack or does not change with lift coefficient is called aerodynamic center. And here we have the result from thin airfoil theory that for any camber, doesn't matter what the camber is, CMC over force, pitching moment about the quarter chord is independent of lift coefficient. That means the quarter chord is the aerodynamic center. So, you know, even long back we started using this result. We started saying pitching moment or aer aerodynamic center for an airfoil is at the quarter chord. This is where it comes from. So we're kind of doing it backwards. So quarter chord is the aerodynamic center, even for a cambered airfoil. Um, so we already had this result for a symmetric airfoil, but now we are saying it's true for a cambered airfoil as well. Okay. Um, so if you plot pitching moment about various points as a function of CL from what we have got before, okay, you will have curves like this. So this is the curve for pitching moment about quarter chord. It's constant. We saw this before. If you plot pitching moment about leading edge, it will be something like this. It will have a negative slope. As CL increases, pitching moment about the leading edge will decrease. If you go to the half chord, it will become like this, and then trailing edge will be like this, and so on. So what we find is all of these curves intersect at this value, and they intersect at lift coefficient of zero. So that means when the lift coefficient is zero, pitching moment, you can take the pitching moment about any chordwise location, and that will always be equal to CMC over four. Let's do an exercise. The, the problem with using pre-prepared notes and just like driving very fast is a lot of things will go, um, you know, you won't absorb it unless you sit down with it later on. So if, I, if you can put pen and paper together just as a quick sort of let's take a break and do something. Um, So did I, many classes back, did I ask you all to think about why the center of pressure goes outside the airfoil? Remember that? So here's how center of pressure as a function of lift coefficient will look like, right? So I'm going to plot X, um, XCP over C versus lift coefficient. And I'm drawing this from memory, so hopefully I get it correct. It'll be, it'll be something like this. Let's just draw the positive lift coefficients. And so here's the airfoil. The reason I draw X over C in the horizontal is we can imagine the airfoil below this. 
we can say, hey, this goes from leading edge to trailing edge. This is the trailing edge. So one of the things this shows is that when you go to small lift coefficients like here, the center of pressure actually goes outside the airfoil, behind the airfoil. It goes behind the trailing edge. Okay, what is center of pressure? Center of pressure is where you can concentrate the entire lift force and put it as a single vector, right? So, for example, if you have a pressure distribution like this, something like this, this is just a rough sketch. This whole pressure distribution can be put as a single force and it will act at the center of, sort of like the center of gravity of this pressure distribution. So it will act here, something like this. So this is the center of pressure. But now we are saying at small lift coefficients, the center of lift acting on the airfoil is actually behind the airfoil. That's the theoretical result. It's almost like saying here is a body, right, some mass distribution, and if I want to put the entire mass as a, or an entire weight of the body as a single force, I'm going to put it here. So center of gravity of this mass is here. That doesn't sound correct, right? So how can it be for a center of pressure, how can the center of pressure, for a pressure distribution, how can the center of pressure be behind the airfoil? Uh, maybe, okay, I'll, I'll ask you later. Anybody else thought about it? I think I asked this as a question. And I actually asked this as a question in pretty much every course. Uh, maybe, I ask in the undergrad courses, at least in Aero 1, when I used to teach Aero 1, I used to ask. No, okay, Ethan, what's, what's? you're kind of going to in the right path, but why should, even if it's a small force, so the answer given is that the force is so small that you need a large lever arm, so the force acts here, and so why should the force act here, right? That's the more, like what makes this situation where the center of pressure distribution acting on the airfoil is actually back here. Okay, so let's think about it in a different way. So you have an airfoil from x equals zero to one, and let's just, instead of a pressure distribution, let's think of two pressure, two forces, and we're going to find the center of two forces. So let's say you have a force F here and a force F here. Where is the center of pressure or center of net force? Yeah, so this is a net force, right, 2F. Now, let's take the same 2F and distribute it differently. Let's take half F here, here, and 1.5F here. So same total force. Where will the center of pressure be? Roughly, just quickly guess, maybe 0.75, somewhere there, right? Something like that, maybe two-thirds of the distance or something. It'll be somewhere here. It'll be on this side of the half. So 2F becomes here. Now let's put something else. Let's put zero force here and 2F here. Where is the center of pressure? It'll be at the trailing edge. So what can you do to make this go outside? Yeah, you put a negative force. So what happens here is if you put half F here, and 2.5F here, the center of pressure will actually go a little bit outside and it will become 2F. So this is 0 to 1. So that's the general idea. So what can we do to a pressure distribution to make the net center of pressure go outside the trailing edge? Yeah, so what happens at small angles of attack, and you can actually go and run this in X-foil for any airfoil. You go to some very low angle of attack. It should be a cambered airfoil. Go to some very low angle of attack. You will see that at low alpha or at low CL, 
a camber air foil will have negative CL at the leading edge, negative lift distribution near leading edge. So it will be something like this. So you will have a, a CP distribution that will look something like this. Um, the upper surface will be smaller here and go like this and the lower surface will be, will be something like this and go like this. So this is actually negative and this is positive. So that's why the center of pressure actually goes behind. And this is the reason why center of pressure is actually inconvenient to use. It's so much easier to use pitching moment. Okay, now I started, I went off on a tangent, right? I was trying to explain this graph. I mean, we can just throw this graph and say this is a behavior, but it's nice to go into depth in some of these things, like think very deeply. What does this mean? Why, why do all these curves intersect at CL equals zero? For that, let's take this example. Let's take this, um, no, let's take, so let's try to answer why do, why do CM leading edge, CM quarter chord, CM half chord, CM any point intersect at CL equals zero. Actually, can we take a minute and you think about it, just think in these kind of terms and take a minute or two and tell me why, why it should happen. Just draw, sketch. It's very hard to just do this without sketching. You have to think about it. So maybe you can say, how does the pressure distribution look at CL equals zero and then go from there? And instead of pressure distribution, use two forces. Okay, anybody have the answer? Yes? No? I thought you were nodding your head, yes. You want some more time? Okay, wait for a minute. Oh. I have the answer in the next page. Okay, I'll use that. Okay, um, anybody close have an inkling of an idea? I can't really describe it well, but I have an idea. Okay, what is it? I was just thinking about it from the, the force from the uh, changes in alpha comes at the quarter chord, whereas the uh, force from uh, changes in camber comes at the half chord. 
So the, that one is going to be dropping off to zero while the other is going to kind of remain constant and it's going to kind of stabilize at one location. Uh, so it went to zero. Okay. I have to un unpack that, you know, most of yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Ethan, you, you were trying? Okay, so let's, you know, let's use this kind of way to think about it because it's just two forces and we can deal with it easily. So suppose I want to put two forces on an airfoil from zero to one. How do I have to put those two forces if lift coefficient is zero? I mean, if I put one force here and I have only one more force left, I have to put it as negative F, right? Now, take the moment about any point. Okay, so let's call this uh, distance as D. The easiest point to take a moment is probably this. Let's take a moment about this point. What is the moment? This is just torque, right? It's not even airfoils. Moment is? F times D, so if let's, sticking to airfoils, if this is positive M, it will be minus F times D. Let's take the moment about this point, what will we get? It will be FD, it will be minus FD, right, same thing. Let's take the moment about this point, then you will have two moments, right, this uh, acting at this distance and this acting at the other distance and it will still turn out to be FD. You can take the moment about any point, you can even go all the way here. So, moment for CL equals zero does not depend on the point about which it's taken. Is there a special word for this kind of torque? So back when you did physics or something or statics or have you heard of the word couple, right? A torque that does not result in any force but results only in a pure moment is called a couple and that's what this couple is. It's like, uh, um, you know, if you want to um, turn turn a nut or something like that with a wrench, you usually use one side and you, you apply a force and a moment. But if you have something like a two-sided wrench, maybe and you, you apply force like this, one force goes down, the other force goes up, you're not applying a force, you're just applying a couple. And the, the special thing about a couple is, it doesn't matter about what point you're looking at, the mo moment will always be the same. And that's what happens here. So at the condition of, so we are talking about this graph, right? Pitching moment curves about all these different locations will always intersect at CL equals zero. And at this condition, at CL equals zero, the aerodynamic pressure distribution results in a couple, a pure moment with no force, right? It's kind of like this or some, you can, it can be a distribution. And because pitching moment about the quarter chord does not change with lift coefficient, at a lift coefficient of zero, that should be the pitching moment. And so all these will intersect at CL equals zero and CM equals C over four. And because of that, we call this pitching moment sometimes as CM zero. Because it means CM at zero CL about any point you want. So CM zero is the same as CM quarter chord and from thin airfoil theory, that's the aerodynamic center, so it's CMAC. So these are all sometimes used interchangeably. Okay, Ho hopefully um, that woke you up a little bit. Okay, now let's get the center of pressure. You know, you plug in some equations from before and you get center of pressure is this. And uh, we can also get the expression for lift coefficient versus alpha. 
um, and we can get the expression for alpha zero lift. So CL turns out to be two pi times this all this stuff, and DCL D alpha is derivative of this. This whole thing goes to zero because this term doesn't depend on alpha. So DCL D alpha is just two pi per radian, or 0.11 for per degree. Right? This is where it comes from. We've been using Lift curve slope is 2 pi per radian, 0.11 per degree. It comes from thin air foil theory. And this is true no matter what the camber is. Okay, so it's true for symmetric airfoil, it's true for cambered airfoils. Later on we'll see even if you deflect a flap, it's true for that as well. As long as you're not going to extremes. So the assumptions in thin air foil theory are that the camber line is small, right? You can't you can't take a big, huge camber line, then it won't work. It's like most regular airfoils have small camber lines and this will work. And then we can get zero lift angle of attack. So that is alpha for CL equals zero, and which is also written as alpha zero lift. We have been talking about this before. And that's just you set this CL to zero and you find the alpha and that turns out to be this expression in, in radians. Um, and so this is, so that's where we get a lift curve behavior. So alpha zero lift is usually negative for most cambered airfoil, something like minus two, minus three degrees. And so when you put those things together, this is your CL alpha curve from thin airfoil theory. Alpha zero lift will depend on the camber, but from there the slope is always two pi per radian doesn't matter what the camber is. So camber just shifts this line to the left and right. And alpha relative to alpha zero lift, which some books call it alpha A, and I think when we talked about profile, we call this alpha Z, just different notation, is alpha minus alpha zero lift. And this gives the expression for lift coefficient two pi times absolute angle of attack. Okay, um, so now we can summarize thin airfoil theory for a cambered airfoil and, um, and then go to an example to sort of work through all those equations that we went through at a very brisk pace. So to summarize, what thin airfoil theory tells us is even for a cambered airfoil, lift curve slope is two pi per radian, which is about 0.11 per degree. CL is two pi times alpha minus alpha zero lift. And you can also write this as two pi alpha A. Remember to keep alpha angles in radians if you use this. Um, if you want to work in degrees, instead of two pi, you put 0.11. And pitching moment about the quarter chord is constant with alpha and CL. So that's why it's called CMAC, and that's also why it becomes CM0, right? CM0, this means um, CM at CL equals zero, which we saw is independent of the location. Okay, so, we have a few more small topics on th in thin airfoil theory, but this covers the big chunk of it. Um, I'll sort of tell you where we are going next and then we'll stop for today. Um, what we're going to do next is we're going to take So we'll work through all the math for an example camber line. And then we'll talk about something called an ideal angle of attack.
and then we'll talk about effect of flap deflection. Deflection just means angle. So, so if you have an airfoil and you have a flap, this, this flap has been deflected by some angle delta F. Okay, so that will be um, what we resume with in the next class. Okay, thanks.